Hello, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today, I'll be doing a watercolor painting. Um, I have my 11 by uh, 15, essentially a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua, cold press, 140 pound paper. I am saturating it with water. And then I will adjust the palette and kind of talk about what's going on. Um, I like to do this first to first get me into um, the flow of talking to go from not talking to suddenly talking. It, it, it works, you know, <laughs> but um, I feel like this kind of helps out and kind of gets my mind in the right place. <clears throat> The unfortunate thing is that I have wet paper and I'm going to be holding the palette over it, so I just can't sit it down. Um, so it is 12 o'clock Monday, so 12 in the afternoon. Um, so it's a little late for my morning painting, but you know, I feel like everything's uh, times blending together. I'm I had put some buff titan, or titan buff. I'm not sure the orientation of those words. It shows up in different brands. That's the um, Van Gogh brand. And some uh, white um, gouache, the Da Vinci brand, on the palette for my last watercolor painting. I am potentially going to use those. We might. We might not. However, um, those two guys, and I probably shouldn't have put them in that location, but... Um, we were doing a lot of experimenting with white paint in the last uh, watercolor video. Palette-wise, set up, those two are very good at contaminating the other paints around them. Meaning that um, their chalkiness, which is something that um, people who do not like white in watercolor will sometimes refer to as the chalkiness that takes place, um, it, it easily spreads once wet and can um, affect the colors around it on the palette. So that's why I'm kind of cleaning off down in these other locations where if these other colors were to um, kind of contaminate other paint around it, it really doesn't matter too much. At least for me, it really doesn't affect it that much. However, like I said, these guys really have a major influence. So I'm just kind of cleaning up this area down here for mixing which I seem to be spreading a bit. Um, so we've been looking at the um, Hudson River Valley painters doing tonalless paintings, um, things like that. I think um, today, you know, we're going to have that tonalist vibe, but we're going to go more just wet and wet and airy, um, just a wet and wet background and uh, potentially just a closer uh, area of, ground, some trees over it, etc. So just a depth of field type painting and um, softness to it. Palette wise, I have my raw sienna here. So I like to have a uh, spritz bottle, um, burnt sienna, burnt umber, that Venetian red, which what I need to do soon is put some light red on here so I can compare the two for y'all. Um, in fact, maybe we'll do that on this painting. Um, ultramarine, the thalo blue, Payne's gray. I have my lamp black. I don't know if we'll use it. And the sap green. So that's kind of just the guys that I usually pull from. We have that lemon yellow, but it really doesn't get utilized that often. And the cerulean blue, um, I find that that's kind of just a good accent in the sky once in a, a while and is usually the focus of a painting so that might not take place either just to kind of give you guys an overview of what i utilize um so i use that venetian red the reason being is when i oil painted i just um and i, and I still oil paint and i use venetian red um as that i just really really like the, the color and the way it lays down with oil painting. 
Um, and then I had bought it in watercolor whenever I um, was looking at Stuart Davies, who is an oil painter, a tonalist, and he uses a red ochre, which is an earth tone, and a sap green. He mixes those two complementary colors to get browns with uh, reds and greens in it to create uh, very interesting, beautiful landscapes. And I utilize that approach with oil now, uh, but I use a Venetian red because I could not find red ochre, um, or at least I think if I did find it, the brand for me was a little too pricey. Um, and then, so I used that there and then I was like, all right, let me pick up sap green and Venetian red in watercolor and try that technique and see what I can do and make happen with um, watercolor. And I've been getting like very, very interesting results from it. So Venetian red, here is um, Van Gogh brand light red oxide. This is the more common one that's often recommended um, in different palettes. This is the one that you would see in um, the Ron Ransom palette. Uh, pigment, it's PR101. Here it's the PR101. Here it says iron oxide. So it's pretty much just what a uh, rust color. If I look at the burnt sienna, let me see which one that is. That's PBR7. So I'm not sure. We'll have to, that's something to look into if it um, is synthetic or pulled from the earth. But, um, but these two are the same pigment, um, the Venetian red and the light red oxide. And that's why I often say in the videos, hey, you could use either one. And I think... Because soon I'm going to have to do an order for um, more oil canvases, or panels. Let's put these two on the palette. And if you look at them, this one is a little dried and probably a little dirty. This one does have an orangier tone to it. It might be the brand. This is... Um, like I said, Da Vinci Venetian Red. This is Van Gogh Light Red Oxide. Um, same pigment. It might just be, um, they might potentially cook them a little differently. I think that's what they do with the um, raw sienna, the burnt sienna. And same thing with uh, raw umber and burnt umber. I'd probably have the Cotman Light Red uh, color around, but I don't want to spend time uh, searching for that. So, actually I have a piece of paper right here. Sorry that this uh, tutorial is turning into a discussion of those two colors. But here's a piece of paper. It feels like it's, um, this might actually be a Arches piece of paper. Let me use a round brush for this. That right there is light red oxide. Oh, now my water's all dirty already. That's all good. That's the Venetian red. So it actually is quite a, a difference. Um, but we are cross-referencing through brands so um, the Da Vinci brand, which has the Venetian red, would have a light red oxide, I believe. And that would probably be a better comparison to see how it goes amongst it. Um, Van Gogh brand, I don't think has a Venetian red. This is more of a student brand, but high quality. Like I highly recommend that brand of paint. I just bought this, like I said, for the other experiment and for the quantity. Um, so it's a little bit darker, but you can see how you could probably just utilize either one. And then it does show a little bit different in the video 
It does show this one darker, this one a little bit more. I don't know if you'd say peach here. Okay, so that's a little experiment for y'all. Now, it is time to start painting. All right, so um, with this, we want to lighten an airy sky. This is our raw sienna. I think we're going to do water reflection, so I'll go up and I'll come down with it. Get a little bit of lizard and crimson on there. Now I'm going really light with this. Um, with the wet and wet with skies, there's a whole bunch of different approaches. Uh, one thing that I talk about quite often is um, Ron Ranson and how he, um, in his book, is essentially almost seemed to delight in the reaction that people would get when he put very heavy pigment load into um, the sky. So try that out um, and see how it how it changes as you dry off. Um, okay, ultramarine. We'll get a little purplish mixing in with that lizard. Not a common mixture for me, but let's play it out. Anyway, um, try out a heavy pigment load and try out a light pigment load. The reason I've been gravitating more towards a lighter pigment load is due to um, an interesting read that I'd saw where the artist was essentially, or the, the, the author of the book was talking about how we often put our skies in way too dark but then again, he was an oil painter. So there's really no uh, drying shift that takes place. I'm putting these in super, super gentle, and they're gonna soften super, super, super gentle. Um, while, like I said, Ron Ranson would put it in a higher pigment load and it would soften as well. Uh, I grabbed some phthalo blue, I'm not sure why. Um, let's put that blue in the sky. Okay. Now I'm going to darken the top portion of the sky. Let's get, um, ultramarine mixed with Payne's gray. So this is kind of just like darkening the um, the ultramarine and giving some life to the pans gray. Um, a lot of artists will avoid having pans gray on the palette um, in watercolor. And a lot of people just seem to not enjoy pans gray. I uh, I'm somebody who does. I like uh, Payne's Gray for um, for clouds, for water, uh, for water edges and whatnot. I just I, I enjoy it. Let's see if we can lift a bright spot. Uh, let's get adventurous with this guy. One thing I've been experimenting with lately is taking raw sienna and stippling it in the wet and wet as if I was doing the um, outline of trees. However, it's been giving 
the effect of um, very interesting clouds that are golden, you know, maybe a sunrise or a sunset, that sun behind them. And then I usually take the Venetian red, but this time I'll take the um, light red oxide for y'all. Feed that in there. So we get those reds and um, yellows in those clouds. That's my tummy. I haven't eaten yet today. I don't know what I'm going to eat. I've been getting in the habit of uh, milk and cereal in the morning now. I don't want to make it just like a straight um, connecting. I want to have some breaks in it. Then, Payne's Gray, feed that to get some of the darks. I do want it to be more gentle, not as bright, but like I said, we'll have that drying. So this will see what um, demonstration of the drying that takes place. And we can take that same color and put in these um, some horizontal clouds right above the horizon. Now the thing is um, that you want to keep in mind, clouds higher up in the sky are usually in general kind of bigger due to perspective and getting potentially closer to you. Clouds along the horizon um, will be narrower. clouds in the distance along the horizon there's you know there's some paintings that have the big old cloud this big coming in on the horizon bringing a storm in and then a great thing with the wet and wet We're just kind of just putting the sky in. This is unfortunately starting to read as a um, another sun. Okay, another thing, great thing with the wet and wet, you can take a paper towel and lift highlights on these. Could even I don't want to fully engulf the sun and have like a circular pattern around it um, I do want to kind of give it an escape and that almost kind of um, breaks a potential symmetry of taking place I'm putting darks up on the higher portion this is Payne's gray all right so so far we did raw sienna, we did um, the, the light red uh, oxide, we did some alizarin in the sky, ultramarine, Payne's gray, and some thalabdu got in there by mistake. Really didn't change it that much. So now we're going to move down to our soft horizon. And all these colors that I've been putting down here, since I want to make it a water scene, I completely forgot about that. I can take these colors, and I don't have to wash the brush off. And I should have been going above and below with these. So we're going to feed in a little bit.
not the best, so we're gonna have to kind of move things around and model it. But um, I was just like quick last ditch effort as things start to dry, so I can put in um, that fiery water. Now I'm gonna grab Haynes Gray. I'm gonna put in a far tree line. And then I'll feed different colors in it. I could essentially start with any color. I'm going above and below to get that reflections to take place. And let's see, I can grab raw sienna to add highlights along the top. I could also um, grab the burnt sienna to feed in here above and below. We are getting high concentration of pigment right now. As you go wet and wet, and as you add color, you do want to increase your pigment concentration. And what that does is, um, it helps prevent the cauliflower effect that can happen. But I do need this to get, um, I think, darker. Okay, so this is um, ultramarine mixed with the paint's gray. And now we're trying to put a variety of um, shapes and the idea of different trees back here. Giving a little bit of contour to this land. Almost kind of coming out um, a little Turner-esque because of the fiery colors. Here, I'm gonna have a foreground landmass. I'm just putting that in now. The reason I'm putting that in now is that um, I like to do wet and wet in there and get some variety with um, the softness and then the harshness when I do it dried. Let's see what else we can do. Let's really throw some um, paints gray back here. Let's try to uh, take a hint from the Hudson River Valley painters and get kind of a layer. But we'll have this background layer of trees and we'll have another layer right here. Right now, everything's been done with the Hake brush. Um, you can take the rigger in here and start playing around and adding some texture. You could also scrape uh, some trunks out and whatnot. However, I think anything along those lines would affect potential um, uh, softness and pushing back at this point. Connecting these two right here to make sure there's a solid connection that's a uh, thing that, I don't know if it was a mistake I used to make, or the best way to call it, it's just something that it always seemed like a little thing was off. And um, having some sort of connection from one side to the other always really works. Just a little bit more Payne's Gray. The reason I'm doing that right here is to have something to stop the eye from going off the page. We could, of course, give this guy the opportunity of having more definition. But you see how I'm starting to affect that wet paint underneath. 
And this will all soften quite a bit as well, so we might have to do more. We got a long hair in the paint. Let's see if I can catch it. Yep. There we go. All right. So we're going super loose with this one. Um, we're going to have this foreground mass that I mentioned. I can take my card. I found that like the sides where I had cut um, do not scrape as well as the actual edges of the original card. Now I'm going to come up back here, wet and wet, but it is going to be the concept of this curve coming around and there's going to be trees. So they're going to be soft. Here is just raw sienna mixed into um, the gunk already on the brush. But the idea is that hopefully these guys will, um, will catch you know, the concept of coming around. This is something I saw in a Hudson River Valley painting um, where I had to really look in and catch that in there. And um, I don't know if it's because they had a lot of time on their hands or if I just wasn't seen in the begin with because of the way I, I read paintings. but. I was like, holy cow, how do you get that in there? And it was so small, and so much, but so important once I noticed it. Here, just to refer back to those painters as well, um, even though we're going at the softness, one thing you can do is lift up around the outside edge of these structures if you want to get some more definition. And that'll give the idea of um, if they're catching that light that's coming through or not. Personally, I think that I'm going to leave it be, but that is just another ex experiment. I'll kind of demonstrate on this one since this one will be hiding back here a little bit. Okay, so you kind of get the idea that I'm t what I'm talking about, where it's um, accentuating that tree. And here, since it's closer, if I wanted to, I could. Um, put a little bit of structure in it. It is going to get mainly covered up, but um, like I said, I think it's important to paint to the edges of a painting, and I also think that it's important to um, paint background objects and build it up, even though you're not going to see it, almost as if um, you're creating an actual um, entire scene. Even though it's not there, you know, you're creating a world Though this might be contradictory to a lot of watercolor painting where you leave masses out in order to um, paint the lighter colors back and over, but I have a kind of heavy-handed approach to watercolors, I believe. Okay, so I'm just giving rocky contours here. Um, you push it in flat and pull. Uh, two people that utilize that a lot is um, Joe Menza. He has a YouTube channel, fantastic guy. Um, really just really good guy. And um, Stephen Cronin, who was the one I believe who got me into the Hake brush himself, itself. He is just a fantastic painter um, and a prolific painter and self-taught. And he's, he's just, I've never talked to him personally, but um, he seems like a very, very nice guy as well. So anyway, this is what we got. We're gonna do a dry off, but we have to be careful. Um, I don't know if it shows up in there. I'm gonna try to tilt this some. The water is, it's not wet enough for it to spread. I don't know if you could see the sheen on the edge of it, but there's a sheen taking place right there, kind of catches it. 
So you see the moisture that's still on this um, paper. And when you blow dry it, you have the potential to spread pigments around. So either use the lower setting, but keep your brush higher up to prevent that spread. Okay. Ooh. Uh, Mark is red. I get um, I'm using my phone to record, and that was a um, message. Anyway, the paper is still damp. The sheen is hardly visible, but you can get some wet and wet um, effects potentially at this point. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have. I talked about having foreground trees here. Sometimes I put the trunks in and then add the trees and sometimes I'll go in reverse and do the foliage and then the trunks. So since I have a little bit of wet and wet here, we'll see if it wants to um, spread out a little bit and diffuse. A little bit darker than I wanted right here. I'm gonna have to rinse off the brush and grab some, um, it's, uh, what's it called, uh, raw sienna. Now this, is where I had come across that background effect that I was talking about, where I was doing the trees in this manner, and it was still wet and wet, and I was just like, oh, that, that's softening so much, it looks like it could be clouds. And then I um, exper experimented further with it, you know? One thing that I, I harp on a lot, and I apologize for uh, repetition in um, my speech, is that painting is a lot about experimenting. And though the expression's a little weird, there's more than one way to skin a cat, there's more than one way to approach painting. And, and look for those different ways. Um, look for those reasons. And where that comes from for me is being a school teacher teaching math is that there is more than one way to achieve an answer. Same thing with, um, I teach physics too, and I, I harp on the uh, mathematics portion of it, mainly because that's what a lot of my students wind up, my students from a physics class wind up going to college, and even if they're not going for physics, it's one of the core classes for a lot of the medical fields and whatnot. And, um, even kinesthesiology students wind up taking um, physics classes. And I know a lot of people struggle in those classes and they often refer to them as um, like a weed out type class. So for my students, I harp on the math a lot. But you know, I try to get them to think different ways and take different approaches. It's a development of um, critical thinking skills. This is the light red oxide. So as you paint, develop critical thinking skills, develop the ability to see things that take place and think, oh, I can apply this technique here, I can do this there, etc. I'm going to take the hake, uh, the rigor. So this is the first, well, no, we did a little bit of rigor back here, I think. First uh, appearance of the rigor for trees in this one. I'm getting a little too close to that uh, white gouache. Fortunately, white gouache dries very hard, so it does become a little bit harder to um, 
pull off of that. Um, the buff Titan, tit titanium buff, not so much. That becomes very easy to uh, re-wet and pull off. I'm not quite sure why. It might have to do with the, um, the fineness of the pigments and how browned it is. Because uh, gouache is essentially watercolor. It's a uh, gum arabic binder, I believe, unless they use something else within it. Ooh, this is coming out very, very nice. I always have a tendency to ground trees, even if I'm not even done with the tree, like I, I need to go down there and put that in place. And it's gonna have a shadow and it's gonna be darker around it, but um, I really find that that is just an important thing for trees. Uh, since we have so much space and light, weave in and out with your branches. Um, change the tone of your branches and the color. When what I mean by that and the reason for that is we have light shining from behind. There's going to be spots where the branch catches the light and glows. Okay, There's going to be spots where it doesn't or it darkens up. Um, there's going to be spots where it's receding into the picture plane so it looks like it's going away from us, so it's gonna be lighter. Spots where it comes out closer to us, it's gonna be darker. And just have fun with the rigor. Um, this is obviously wet and wet taking place in some spots, so you can see the difference. But it adds for interesting effects. And if you know me by now, I like to have other guys coming up around them. Darken around these rocks. We may come like dark, dark later on. But it's just a variation of tone here. And it's the variation of tone is giving the idea of shadows. It also gives the idea of planes where there's the flatter top of the rock catching the light, there's the backside not catching it, etc. Now, we can take a darker color. And this is usually my my most recent progression with uh, trees. I'm taking ultramarine blue, and I can mix it with like Venetian red, anything like that. No, not Venetian red. Um, raw sienna. Kind of get a grayish blue, greenish, and I like to darken. inner pieces of these trees. This to me gives me a um, the shadows in the trees. It also helps me with the density of the trees where the outer edges have the light coming through it a lot easier so it's lighter and glowing and then the inner portions are thicker and not glowing so bright. At least that's the logic that I'm taking with it. Grab a little bit of um, Payne's Gray. You can darken some of these as well. So this is an imaginary scene. A lot of my scenes are imaginary. Um, you know, so it's just kind of stream of conscious flow through it. But. Um, which there's good and bad to it. There's positives and negatives. You could find yourself getting caught in the same old thing. And that's why I did some Hudson River Valley paintings last week, some tonalist, 
and now I'm trying to do like a um, very soft background one to keep myself fresh and to have um, different tricks in my bag of rep, um, bag of tricks, you know. But so be careful, constantly painting from your imagination. Explore different things. Um, but then exploring from the imagination probably also helps you know when you're painting from real life things to look for. Like think about where it's catching shadows. Um, you'll start inherently knowing, okay, this backside of this tree is going to have shadow. And when you're out there painting in public or from a photograph, you'll look for that shadow that it casts. I wish I could paint outside all the time, but um, down in Louisiana, this wet and wet, this before I even did the sky, the whole painting would be dry. Even if the humidity level's high, paintings just handle so differently outdoors. And I'm a, I'm a relatively fast painter, and it dries fast for me down here. What I'm thinking is we'll ride bikes to the um, the square today. Social distance, of course. We'll ride bikes to the square and then um, maybe just sit in the grass. Don't sit on any benches. Um, and then, you know, just draw and sketch uh, the square. cat wants one here so bad. A little um, pieces of grass. You could have some more um, stick objects, uh, trunks, uh, branches, etc. down here. Let me stand up and take a look at what's taking place. I think this one's coming out pretty pretty. We may need a few more darks in these trees. Maybe a few light stippling taking place. But we're almost near our end point. Not sure how long this painting actually took because I did do quite a bit of rambling about the uh, paints in the beginning. But hopefully that um, enlightened you all about the Venetian red and the uh, light red oxide. Alright, a little Payne's gray. if there's any last bit that we want to stipple some color in. Raw sienna. I think we'll dry it off, sign it, and call it. Or we could put up... Um, Oh, we could put a sailboat in there if we wanted. Let me see. That's where it's good to have like a piece of paper nearby. And you could draw a sailboat. And put it right in there. 
that's the exact spot where I'd put it. I think I have to dry off and then I'll we'll think about it. Okay, so that's where we're at dried. Um, I'm gonna put a sailboat right in here. I think I might. Let's do it. Get in the dark, ultramarine blue. And we have the the gouache. We can try wetting that and use that. I don't think I've ever used gouache for a sail, so. Do a single stroke down. Oh, not enough. Um, let's try this off. It looks pretty cool. So um, everything's done with this one. Um, a few things in hindsight while I sign this, uh, things that we could think about. Okay. Um, sun setting, we got that soft reflection. We could have gotten more dramatic by, remember when I had put that painting down, the paints down here really quick to kind of be like, okay, let's get the colors from the sky down in here. I could have dry brushed a color over that and left white, and that would have given the effect of um, the rippling of the sun effect over the water. Could have also potentially dried brushed with um, gouache, but I don't think it really would have worked that well. But those are some things for you all to keep in mind and stuff that we can um, maybe try in the future. So we'll sign it um, down in here.
put a mat over it. Then I'll start the process of uh, putting it out on social media for you all to see. Um, hope you enjoyed. Uh, please like, subscribe, follow, leave comments, ask questions. Please consider uh, supporting me on Patreon. I have like two really cheap levels. One is like $3, the other one's $5. And it's just to help purchase more and more supplies and whatnot and continue producing uh, content for y'all. So, I hope you enjoyed. Um, oh yeah, feel free to follow along. I would love to see y'all's results. And uh, take care. Have a great day.